Hello, welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester, I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm pleased to introduce tonight's Hammer Forum on the differences and the growing conflict between Sunni and Shia Islam with Dr. Khalid Abu El Fadl and Imam Syed Mustafa Al Kazwini, and moderated by Ian Masters. So on to tonight's program. The Hammer Forum is a series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the generous support of Andy and Branya Galef. Thank you very much to Andy and Branya. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Ian Masters, who will introduce our guest speakers. Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who has covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of The Daily Briefing on Mondays through Thursdays at 5 p.m., as well as background briefing, briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m., all on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA's Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations, and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia. And um, our third panelist tonight, or guest, Hamid Dabashi of Columbia University, Professor of, uh, of Comparative Literature. He's been an American citizen for over 30 years, and he just returned from an academic conference uh, in Seoul, South Korea, and was pulled into the back room of emigration at the airport, uh, where they downloaded all the data on his laptop and his iPhone, and he found it to be a deeply humiliating experience. Uh, and uh, before coming here, Columbia University's uh, lawyers tried to get Homeland Security to give him a guarantee that he would not go through a similar humiliation uh, in a domestic flight out here to Los Angeles, and that wasn't forthcoming. So he decided, because of his uh, frail health, that he didn't want to submit himself to that kind of abuse. So he will not be with us, of course, tonight. Um, but thank all, I thank all of you for coming tonight to learn about what appears to be an intensifying struggle within Islam that is being inflamed by the civil war in Syria, which is viewed by many as a regional proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, within a broader global competition between the US and the West on one side and Russia and China on the other. And as the reactions to today's bombings at the Iranian embassy in Beirut suggest, with Iran blaming Israel and Syria saying it reeks of Saudi and Gulf petrodollars, this cauldron of conflicting local, regional, and global interests could at any moment boil over into a wider war. But as things stand, it's bad enough with the death of over 100,000, the displacement of one third of the population, and the destruction of the state of Syria. What started out as a spontaneous popular uprising for freedom and democracy against a ruling mafia family dictatorship inspired by the Arab Spring and the fall of Gaddafi has taken a descent into hell with brutal and sectarian savagery characterized by a recent incident in a field hospital where a wounded and delirious rebel fighter was overheard reciting a list of Shia shrines this prompted a rebel from an Al-Qaeda-affiliated group to not just execute the man on the spot, but to behead him. But when the bloody trophy was brandished aloft to cries of Allah Akbar, someone noticed that the severed head belonged to a fellow Sunni rebel commander, and now no doubt the executioner on the run when caught will suffer a similar fate. Unfortunately, murder, rape, and pillage in the name of God is nothing new from the Crusades to the Thirty Year War in Europe, to the Spanish Inquisition, to the burning of witches in the Massachusetts colony, to the recent troubles in Northern Ireland, and the pogroms by Buddhists in Myanmar or Burma, all of which attest to the equal opportunity nature of religious tyranny and terrorism. But when it comes to Islam, it does seem we are particularly attuned to the excesses committed in its name and blind to the virtues of the real religion and the piety of its believers. And Bush, Cheney, Rice, and Rumsfeld did not help in that regard with their knee-jerk reaction to 9-11 as they took bin Laden's bait and were goaded into an endless war by a hopeless fanatic, mislabeling a bunch of criminal mass murderers with the word that means struggle in a religious context, jihad. 
And although Obama has changed the label on the war on terror, the toxic stew of ignorance and paranoia festering inside Islamophobia is unfortunately alive and well in the heartland of the homeland, mm -hmm. with state legislatures in Kansas and Oklahoma passing bills to combat the phantom menace of Sharia law, a scourge upon the land that exists only in the fevered imaginations of so-called Christian ministers like the Quran burning, gun-toting pastor in Florida who gets a lot more TV carriage, coverage than our learned guests here tonight do. Dr. Khaled Abu El Fadl will begin our discussion, not as a representative of Sunni Islam, but as a scholar of Islam, Islamic law, and a keen observer of the geopolitical turmoil unleashed by the Arab Spring that has seesawed back and forth from hope to despair, from promise to peril, and from obstinance to opportunity. Then Imam Sayed Mustafa al Kazwini will speak, again, not as a representative of Shia Islam, taking a side in a sectarian debate, but rather as a scholar enlightening us about the theology and history of the world's second biggest religion with 1.6 billion followers representing 23% of the world's population. He will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes followed by a discussion amongst us before extensive Q&A with you, our audience. Dr. Khaled Abu El Fadl is a distinguished professor of law at UCLA School of Law where he teaches international human rights, Islamic jur jurisprudence, national security law, law and terrorism, Islam and human rights, political asylum, and political crimes and legal systems. He's the author of The Great Theft, Wrestling Islam from the Extremists, which was the first work to delineate the key differences between moderate and extremist is Muslims. It was named one of the top 100 books of the year by Canada's leading national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. And his book, The Search for Beauty in Islam, a conference of the books, is a landmark work in modern Muslim literature. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Khaled Abu El Fadl. Thank you, Ian. Um, eloquent and, and uh, brilliant as usual. Um, I, uh, my, my first thought goes out to uh, my colleague, uh, and friend, Professor Hamid Dabashi, uh, who uh, would, uh, would have uh, helped cover the rather large and complicated ter terrain of uh, Shia Sunni theology, history, and then uh, the complicated geopolitical picture. Um, and in the time available, at least in the brief introductory comments, I really uh, have, uh, I only uh, have the, the, the opportunity to highlight some of the key issues um, that I think deserve uh, further discussion and um, analysis. Uh, the, 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 the theological divide between the Sunnah and Shia, uh, it's fair to say that the, everything about that theological divide is contested, including exactly how it developed or uh, why it developed. Uh, like many issues of uh, hermeneutics and uh, historical memory, uh, it is often negotiated by people who are, have an investment in the outcome of the debate. But essentially, and with considerable amount of uh, inaccuracy, the dispute starts out straightforward enough as a dispute over the succession of the prophet of the nascent Muslim nation uh, established in Medina and Arabia by the time that the prophet dies. As often happens, uh, the political dispute, um, whether it covered an ideological divide or spawned the ideological divide is debatable. But in all cases, 
there became a fundamental question of um, uh, the the, oblig the imperative of God's law, the bearers of God's law, and who is in the most privy position to know God's law. But one thing is undeniable and certain is that Shia Islam historically is as old as Sunni Islam. And from a scholarly point of view, the divide doesn't become institutionalized and labeled until at least the second, end of the second, beginning of the third Islamic century, when it becomes a, a, a further theorized and institutionalized uh, divide. Furthermore, um, the theological debates are often um, uh, uh, abstract and, uh, uh, and convoluted. Uh, it, the, the reductionism into a black and white position uh, is extremely unfortunate, uh, which is part of what creates the current crisis today. While there has been a persistent trend among Sunni Islam, in Sunni Islam, to uh, adopt, to believe that Sunnis themselves represent orthodoxy and the norm and the mainstream, that belief is coupled with an exclusionary attitude towards the Shia, who are often in Islamic literature uh, are portrayed as um, somehow as having innovated elements in the faith that were not there originally. On the other side of things, <clears throat> there is no question that the Shia for centuries and for, in fact, most of their history, um, role, play a very important and critical political role, and that is they are always on the, the, the role of the oppressed uh, uh, witness. They often bear witness to uh, the injustices, political oppression, uh, economic injustices of the majority, and have developed a rather complicated narratives, um, uh, liturgical and otherwise, to uh, um, in, uh, in bolstering this uh, essential theology of bearing witness to uh, injustice and suffering. Now, it, the Islamic, beyond this fundamental, conceptual, uh, very general, and I say, as I said, also somewhat inaccurate uh, uh, characterization, the history of Sunni and Shia Islam is infinitely complex um, between periods of greater tolerance so that we know, for instance, one of the fascinating uh, uh, processes in Islamic history is that many of the juristic founders of Sunni Islam had studied with the same uh, 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 founding fathers of Shia Islam. So Shafi, for instance, was student of Jafar Sadiq and so on and so forth. Second is that we also have periods in Islamic history in which it was not unusual for a jurist to become licensed in Sunni, one of the guilds of Sunni law, as well as uh, a guild of Shia law. And the, the jurisprudence, at least, uh, of both groups is remarkably similar. So for instance, 
the Jafaris and Zaydis tend to be, I'm sorry, the Jafaris and Shafis, uh, Shafi is Sunni and Jafari is Shi'i, uh, their law tends to be very similar, and the Zaydi and Hanafi, Hanafi Sunni and Zaydi Shi'i to be, uh, tends to be quite similar as well. I don't believe in historical inevitabilities, and I don't believe in historical determinism. Um, how the, the cumulative process of histories, what they could have ended up yielding, um, uh, it, it's, uh, I don't have a fatalistic view to, towards that. And so when attempting to interpret uh, more recent events, uh, one cannot simply assume that a disagreement that existed or was debated or excited people uh, 1,200 years ago is the same exact disagreement today. What we do know is that in various periods of complex dynamics and interaction, along the way there develops a largely Shia uh, uh, dynasty or um, uh, uh, um, political, um, um, it's not really an empire, but it was a political state focused in Iran and some of what is today Iraq called the uh, Safawiya, and the Ottoman Khilafa, uh, which covered most of the Sunni Muslim world. Relations between the two was complex and, um, and, and, um, tended to facilitate between periods of tension and periods of, of cooperation and so on. But the defining moment, and as in a lot of things in modern Islam, the defining moment occurs with the crumbling of the Ottoman Caliphate and the destruction of the Safavid Caliphate and the beginning of the colonial era. In the, in the, in, uh, around the, uh, run in the 17th century is the birth of the puritanical movement of Saudi Arabia, Wahhabi, uh, uh, that was founded by Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. Um, but it, it doesn't really kick into a major geopolitical influence until the 18th and 19th century, especially the late 18th century and beginning of the 19th century. And what is distinctive about that historical moment is that the focus for the first time of the theological group that eventually becomes uh, uh, in control of Mecca and Medina. Mecca and Medina, the two holiest sites of Islam, they're sort of the heartland of Islamic symbolic sanctity. Uh, falls to a, a, a very puritanical Islamic orientation that was primarily focused, essentially focused, on orthoproxy or orthodox practice and on fighting what they considered to be innovations and corruptions to the faith. So, in other words, the, 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 the interest of the Wahhabi movement in puritanical, uh, the, the puritanical movement, which is in, now in what is today Saudi Arabia, uh, was on the idea of um, a, a correct Islamic practice, as they defined it, and in that process, uh, seeing heterodoxies and um, her heresism, or what from their perspective is our heretical beliefs, whether Shi'i or Sufi or rationalist, as far more dangerous to the faith than any external non-Muslim threat. And so in the, in, in the emergence of Wahhabi and the history of Wahhabi Islam, uh, while the Wahhabi movement never clashed, in fact, entered into an alliance with British colonialism uh, and uh, never had a, a tense relationship with British colonial powers, uh, along the way they commit a rather infamous massacre in Karbala, which is the uh, holiest, uh, uh, one of the, the, the uh, holy sites for uh, Shia Islam, 
um, and, and it, it's a, it, and much of their of their um, narratives and theological arguments are focused on the idea of the one uh, uh, one saved group, the one truly pious, truly Muslim group and then levels of deviation beyond that one group. And so, and the Shiites in the theological outlook are sort of the bottom of the barrel. They are the, the uh, more deviant than the Sufis and as deviant as the rationalists or what sometimes are called the Mu'tazila and a bit of a misnomer. Anyway, this, even that picture, could, does not uh, uh, did not have to yield any historical inevitabilities. It is possible that Saudi Arabia would have adjusted itself theologically, but what happens is that Saudi at, at some point in the 70s, the Saudi government realizes that they are in a particularly sensitive position as the quote unquote protectors or guardians of the two holy sites. As something that they 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 uh, um, emphasized as a tool for uh, uh, augmenting their own sense of legitimacy, and that is that in this position of being the one in control of Hijaz of Mecca and Medina, is impossible to maintain and to sustain unless they also have a far greater impact theologically than their own uh, territorial boundaries in the Muslim world. And in the 70s, but especially in the 80s, starts a very aggressive, and, and partly in response to the Iranian rev revolution, which was seen by Saudi Arabia not as a anti-colonial revolution or an anti-imperialist revolution, and just early gestures by the Iranian revolution to produce a Sunni Shia reconciliation was all uh, rebuffed, but was seen as a, 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 a serious danger of an heterodoxy and eventual challenge to orthodoxy that is followed and imposed by Saudi Arabia. Now, as I said, there is a lot of narrative and a lot of territory to cover, but I just want to take two minutes and, and uh, uh, comment about the current picture. One of the most intriguing processes in modern Islam, and it's something that I hope we can, we can discuss, uh, is that I have been studying recently the use the, the passage and the movement of terminology from uh, uh, describing the Muslim world and Muslim theology and Muslim movements in the Muslim world. And one of the most striking things is the importation of labels invented in the West and adopted by Muslims in their self-discourses about the self. So for instance, the expression jihadi Islam was invented in the West, adopted by Muslims, many Muslim commentators, militant Islam, the same thing, uh, political Islam, Islam siyasi, uh, invented in the West, adopted. But among those key phrases that was adopted in the West and imported and used uh, with great effect in modern the modern Middle Eastern context, is the idea of the Shi'i crescent, or the Shi'i crescent, al-Hilal al-Shi'i. The idea that the Shi'a are getting together to form a systematic threat to Sunni Islam, and that crescent is supposed to cover Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And that idea was very much like the paranoid politics of Islamophobia and every paranoid politics everywhere, uh, was quite effective in getting those who are already anxious because of complicated geopolitical factors and already have a considerable amount of 
anxiety about uh, various frustrations in their contemporary reality to adopt wholeheartedly the idea that Sunni Islam is under a threat from uh, this so-called Shia crescent. Now, I can, and I won't do that, but I, I, I can sit here and deconstruct the absurdity of the idea of the Shia crescent and the, 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 the unified threat to Sunni Islam. Um, and But it, uh, I will leave this to discussion. What remains, though, is, uh, uh, um, as a theologian more than as an academic, what remains critical and problematic and sort of goes to the heart of the matter is that since the uh, flourishing of puritanical Islam on the scene and the retreat of Sufi Islam in the 70s and 80s, and the retreat of the attempts uh, uh, in the age of colonialism to reconcile between Sunnah and Shia uh, is that consistent and persistent notion that somehow among, uh, found among increasing numbers of Muslim clergy in the modern age that Shia Islam is somehow a peripheral Islam or not mainstream Islam. It's not in the heartland of what the Islamic Islamism is, whatever the ism is. And I think that in terms of thinking of categories of negating the other and excluding the other and uh, undermining the being of the other, that to me, from a theological and moral perspective, remains the most problematic aspect of contemporary Muslim discourses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. El Fadl. Imam Syed Mustafa al Kaswini has achieved recognition as a religious educator, leader, and author. Born in the city of Kabbalah, Iraq, Imam al Kaswini traces his lineage 42 generations back to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He is recognized for his clear ideas and realistic solutions to issues of concerns to Muslims, including family, human rights, religious freedom, nonviolence, tolerance and forgiveness, debate and discussion, and democracy, especially addressing that Islam and democracy are compatible. Imam al Khwazini initiated his higher religious studies in Qum, Iran, and served as professor of Islamic studies at the Islamic Seminary in Damascus, Syria. And shortly after his arrival in California in 1994, he became the founder and director of the Islamic Cultural Center of San Diego. And in 1996, he founded the Islamic Educational Center of Orange County, also the first Shia mosque to open in Orange County. Ladies and gentlemen, Imam Syed Mustafa al Kaswini. Good evening. I'm honored to be among you tonight and also to share the panel with the Honorable Dr. Abul Fadl. Let me uh, take you back to the beginning of the journey where Prophet Muhammad founded Islam in Mecca and Arabia. Uh, Muslim theologians and historians tend to say that Islam was founded upon two foundations. One, Tawheedul Kalima, monotheism. And the second, monotheism means the unity of God. And the second pillar was the unity of mankind or the ummah, the nation. And the prophet, he uh, strived very hard to, uh, to build this harmony and this unity among his uh, followers. And we believe that it is still inseparable, indivisible, the unity of God and the unity of the citizens. And one of his main objectives when he moved from his hometown in Mecca going to Medina, uh, where he lived his, uh, his last uh, 10 years, and he's buried there in Medina, was to create this uh, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood among the, the Muslims there. And this spirit of harmony continued for a long time. But we have to admit that it was not a complete and absolute harmony among the Muslims. Sometimes, you know, some historians tend to say that 
uh, Muslims during the time of the Prophet, they lived in absolute harmony, brotherhood, friendship, unity, you know, forgiveness, but this is not the case. If you examine, carefully examine the history of Islam, there were many rivalries, jealousy among them. Most of them, they come from tribes, you know, and educated, illiterate people. And even the Quran alludes to this fact that they came from the time of ignorance. So there were a lot of discord among them, even during the time of Prophet Muhammad. And this discord escalated immediately after his death, where they broke into not just two groups, Shias or Sunnis. Uh, by the way, Shias and Sunnis, these are very contemporary and modern terms. Uh, if we analyze the situation, uh, it is not Shias or Sunnis. The best description is the people who followed the Prophet and his household, his family. They believe that he appointed his family after him, his uh, son-in-law and his you know, successor, Ali. And on the other hand, the people who followed some, some of the companions of the Prophet. So, but Islam is not a monolithic religion in its theology, its philosophy, and its jurisprudence. It's very diverse, and Islam promotes pluralism and multiplicity. Uh, and of course, we believe diversity in Islam is a source of strength. And there is a hadith saying of the Prophet where he says, اختلافُ أمتي رحمة The diversity and the multiplicity of my community is a source of power, source of strength and mercy for them. And that expresses Islam's openness and uh, promotion of diverse thinking. We have uh, something called ijtihad, which is the uh, reasoning, where we have many scholars, theologians, uh, where they issue their fatwas and their verdicts according to the Quran and the tradition of the Prophet. And in the Shia Islam, we promote this type of thinking that uh, you don't have to follow certain people. You can, as long as you understand the Quran and you, you understand, uh, qualify to understand the Sunnah, the tradition, the sayings of the Prophet, you can give your own, your own fatwa, your own idea on particular issues. But unfortunately, individuals and groups arose who broke away from this pristine vision of Prophet Muhammad and they began to interpret religion in a very rigid and intolerant, intolerant manner, implementing their narrow understanding violently as a strategic means to garner power. Only three decades after the death of Prophet Muhammad, a man came to power, a man seized power by the name of Muawiyah, and, uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, uh, about 30 or 31 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, who founded dictatorship and totalitarianism in Islam. And, uh, and this uh, dictatorship uh, continued for many, many, many centuries after him. And this ideology was also resurrected after that, about 700 years, by an Assyrian uh, a theologian from Damascus by the name of Imam Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Taymiyyah. The mastermind of sectarianism and sectarian division in Islam. This is probably the very first time in the history of Islam you can find a prominent theologian and jurist who promotes sectarianism. He, he wrote many theses. One of them is entitled that Jawaz uh, Qital uh, al the uh, giving permission to slaughter and to kill his opponents. And we see this phenomena for the very first time in the history of Islam. After him, about 400 years after Ibn Taymiyyah, again his ideas were adopted by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in Najd in Arabia. Uh, where Dr. Abul Fadl earlier alluded to that. Again, he continued the tradition and the uh, doctrine of Ibn Taymiyyah. 
and he established, he's the, the founder of Wahhabism, where uh, not only uh, non-Muslims suffered from it, but first, uh, Muslims were victims of Wahhabism, the extremism and violence of Wahhabism in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula first, and then, of course, spelled out to neighboring countries where Abu al Dr. Abu al mentioned the massacre uh, of uh, the city of Karbala that took place about 150 years, where pilgrims, they gathered in the city of Karbala to visit, pay uh, homage to the shrine of Imam Hussein, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, and they were attacked by the Wahhabis coming all the way, traveling through the desert from Saudi Arabia to Iraq, and they massacred all the worshippers in sh inside the holy shrine at that time. And still, this is happening, you know, this, these types of, you know, genocides are taking place nowadays in many countries in the Middle East. You can see them in, in Syria, uh, in Iraq on daily basis, and what we just heard about in Beirut, Lebanon, another example of that genocide. Uh, the contemporary situation in the Muslim world is very deplorable and, and to me is very despondent due to the increased and vast uh, expenditure of petrodollars to further this violence. There are some governments who allocated, I would not say millions, but billions, rather billions of dollars to fuel and uh, incite uh, uh, tension and sectarianism among the Muslim Ummah. And the money is being spent generously. Uh, those of you who travel to the Middle East, you can uh, notice that very clearly, that there is a lot of money being spent, uh, a lot of lobby lobbying happening to fuel this division and this hate and sectarianism among the Muslim community. Our government here, the United States, in its uh, struggle to combat terrorism and Islamic radicalism, they resorted to, to increased use of drones. But the drones, in my opinion, are not effective and not sufficient enough. The government of the United States uh, has to exterminate the root of extremism the roots of extremism. You know, killing you know, one or two here or there in this desert in Pakistan, in Yemen, in other places would not you know, bring the, the, the problem to an end. There are people there sitting in certain capitals and being generous and sending money and encouraging the young ones, you know, brainwashing them to go and kill themselves. Be suicide bombers, you know, you kill yourself today if you kill yourself in the morning, you're going to have lunch with the Prophet Muhammad in paradise. If you kill yourself in the afternoon, you're going to have dinner you know, with him, depending on what time you choose. So if you like lunch or dinner, so this is exactly what's happening. This is not a joke. This is a reality. And we, we, see, we see hundreds, hundreds of young men and sometimes women in many countries nowadays, they today, just today in Beirut, two people, they killed themselves, thinking that they're going to dine with the Prophet. And the virgins are waiting for them there, you know, 70 virgins are going to usher them inside paradise. This ideology is being fueled and promoted by certain governments with a huge budget. This is not just something happening at random. It is a very uh, uh, concerted effort. So, global sectarianism and radicalism is not only dangerous uh, to the Muslims, but for the entire globe. And, uh, and now, a very clear example of that, what is happening in Syria, which is becoming an international hub for the Salafi jihadis. And by the way, for those of you who would like to know about Salafi, Salafis is a term used by some people who believe that they follow the uh, exact tradition of Prophet Muhammad and his companions who surrounded him. Those are called Salaf, the early companions of the Prophet. So there are some people who call themselves Salafi, but of course, uh, in reality, they don't follow the, the tradition of the Prophet. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate here and say that Islam is, is, is based on absolute peace. We did have you know, bloodshed. 
we did have a conflict in Islam in the beginning, and still we do have, but uh, uh, Islam does not call for the slaughtering of the others, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, just because they disagree with you uh, on, on your opinions. So what is happening in Syria is very dangerous, and I call those people who are fighting in Syria nowadays the neo-Taliban, and uh, they try to grab power there and spread greater destruction, not only in Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, but in the entire region and in the entire Middle East. And I think the international community has an important duty to, to, to stop what is happening. And I hope we can continue on this discussion soon. Thank you. So let me begin with uh, Dr. Al Fadl. The, you, you talked about uh, the, the Wahhabi sect and its beginnings, and I believe it started coincidentally with the American Revolution, I think, pretty coincidentally. Um, but is it true that Mecca and Medina, prior to that, uh, were uh, places of a diverse Islamic scholarship and that, that over the years... With the, with the petrodollars, et cetera, it's, it has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, and that that this has really, uh, you know, uh, affected the the inherent diversity and scholarship that in this religion. Yeah, there is a, uh, a a rather long, centuries old uh, tradition um, in which. Practically any mo uh, theological or intellectual or legal movement that has any value would always seek to create representation for itself in uh, Mecca and Medina or the Hejaz. And uh, the, the Hejaz, the area where Mecca and Medina uh, are, uh, have always uh, I mean it's since the the um, at the time of the prophet two things there is a tendency violated at times but most of the time respected to keep the Hijaz out of political conflicts um, so with uh, with certain exceptions that are well known in history the the Hijaz tended to uh, be a, a, a invaluable area, which made it attractive to uh, practically. Uh, um, uh, I mean, the every Sufi group until the rise of Wahhabism uh, had representatives in the Hejaz. Every uh, legal uh, school of uh, guild of law uh, or uh, had a representative, representative in the Hejaz or in institutional existence. Uh, the the existence. I mean, it's not by accident that in South Arabia till today there are a large number of Shia Muslim persecuted as they are, but the the official representation of of the uh, of the Shia so called Ahl al Bayt uh, um, uh, uh, faction. Uh, has uh, uh, in the Hijaz has existed for uh, numerous centuries. One of the the earmarks of the Wahhabi movement um, has been the destruction of historical sites, uh, um, archaeological sites, and also all I uh, theological and jurisprudential orientations that are seen as in any way heterodox. And so literally, the uh, Hejaz has been emptied of all semblances of, uh, uh, I mean, just the, 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 num the existence of the number of singing uh, 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 Sufi groups that, that, that incorporated song and dance in their rituals in the Hejaz up to the rise of the Wahhabi movement. And in fact, some of the literature of the Wahhabi movement was Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab in, in, uh, and his students in famous treaties say that everywhere we look around in the Hejaz, we see corruption. And what they saw as corruption was what 
anthropologists and archaeologists would say, would see as cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they, they and they, they uh, say, oh, we, we see people singing, dancing. We see uh, people uh, going to shrines. We there, there's a, even a story of an evil uh, Satan possessed tree in the middle of I don't know, the, and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, what the common culture, interestingly, today. Um, uh, that has swept uh, the Hijaz area, and and you see it in the architecture and in the uh, in the buildings and the in the um, sociological manifestations, uh, is a really a very stark, vulgar culture of um, what uh, Imam Khazwini called the petrodollars, and that's quite true. Uh, the thing that is quite remarkable about Hijaz. Uh, historical sites have been destroyed or erased or marginalized, and you see these amazing, fancy uh, chain hotels like the Hilton and Sheraton, and uh, and a thoroughly consumer-based culture uh, that is um, as far removed as one tends to think of uh, uh, spirituality, except in a very postmodern sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So let me ask you, um, Mustafa Al Um We've talked a lot about how the Wahhabis have have uh, captured or set Islam back in this in in this uh, austere and fundamentalist way that they have, and fueled by petrol dollars. And we know that the Saudi royal family uses them as a as a as a kind of tool to keep the people down because if you, through the ubiquitous religious police, the strictures are so great that people don't have any time to think about politics or rebellion because they are so oppressed within their own bodies by these strictures that are imposed on them. And all you have to do is go to the airport in Saudi Arabia and Time magazine and a picture of a of a model selling a cigarette is all blacked out. They actually hire people to do this on a daily basis. So we, we, what's, what are the equivalents, though, in terms of Shia Islam? Is there fundamentalism? Is it a problem? I mean, a lot of people were offended by the former president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, who in many ways had a peculiar kind of messianic bent. So give us a sense of of whether or not there's a mirror in terms of fundamentalism on the Shia side. Radicalism does exist in every, every creed and every culture and every religion. And yes, we do have in Shia Islam, we do have uh, some radicals, but the example you cited, he is not a theologian, he is a politician, and you know, politicians, they have to sometimes to be radicals, so. Right. To win over the, you know, public opinion. So. Uh, but uh, if it comes to religious radicalism, I don't see we we have it in Shia Islam as it it does exist in the in the Wahhabi Islam. And by the way, it's not uh, correct to divide the Muslims into two groups. I think we have uh, three groups here. We have the main Sunnis who are mostly peaceful, and uh, they have no problem with their brethren. And this is an example of them here sitting here. And we have the Shias on the other hand, and we have the Wahhabis. We have Wahhabis. Wahhabis, they don't get along neither with the Shia, nor with the Sunnis, nor with, with any person, you know. They are God-created paradise only for them, only for them. They are the only people who, have, who got the visa to go to paradise. And the rest of us, we have to go to hellfire, you know. So, uh, no, we don't have that type of radicalism within Shia Islam. Uh, let me say something, add to what uh, Dr. Abul Fald mentioned. I've been going to Hajj for the last probably 25 years. Uh, I go to Saudi Arabia twice a year. One, one time for the Hajj, the bigger uh, pilgrimage, and, and, and another time for the lesser Umrah, lesser pilgrimage. And what I have noticed and what I have been hearing from the group that they come with us, they say, we did all these rituals in Hajj, you know, uh, circumambulating around the, 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 the house of God, the Kaaba, going between these two mountains, sleeping in a desert, but spirituality is missing. 
And the reason, because as Dr. Abul Fadl mentioned, uh, the Wahhabis, they demolished all the religious, historic sites there, and they built skyscrapers. And so people tell me, this is not Mecca anymore. This is more like Las Vegas here, you know. So, uh, and, f and, and I heard this from many people this year that we really are not enjoying this experience anymore. So, the, when you mentioned uh, that there were the, the Sufis uh, were basically purged from Mecca and Medina, they also seem to be the primary target in, in, of, of the Taliban, both in, the, the, uh, in Pakistan, the Pakistani Taliban. Uh, I mean, what, it, what is this? You say it's just because any, anybody having a good time or, or being a human being or having any cultural diversity is, is, is suspect. But it, it, how, can you, how can the Saudi royal family maintain this control when behind the walls of their palaces they're as, a, as debauched as anybody, or in fact more debauched than most people are? I mean, in other words, when is the hypocrisy going to catch up on them? Uh, that, that that's a that, that's a tough one. Um, I, I I don't know. <laughs> what they, I can I mean I'll tell you that uh, in until uh, recently I, I used to travel to Saudi Arabia uh, quite frequently, uh, mostly for same purposes as, as Imam Qaswini. Uh, said but, um, in um, uh, uh, at times where I, where I function more as a lawyer than a, uh, a theologian. Or, uh, uh, one of the very striking things in, in Saudi culture is uh, the higher classes. I mean, it's the only place in the world where among, in higher class homes, they had specialized alcohol crushing machines, or machines that crush wine and alcohol bottles so that when they're thrown out in the garbage, no one can identify what they are. And, um, and I attended functions uh, where politicians were invited and, and so on and so forth, and, and uh, uh, executives from American corporations. And the Russian ambassador who was sitting on my table commented to me that uh, he waits for this event each year because alcohol, the, the scotch he drinks here, uh, is unequal in, he, in, in his experience. And, uh, it, but there is a, a, a remarkable duality that, um, uh, uh, in that, on the one hand, uh, Wahhabi theology uh, advocates this austere textualism in which uh, the range of hermeneutical interpretation is extremely narrow and in which uh, the method, uh, juristic tools, to the extent that juristic tools uh, employ rationalistic methodologies and uh, accept notions of diversity and, 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 and so on, uh, they're, they're all flattened and literally deconstructed into this very puritanical approach to, to text. But at the same time, traditional Wahhabism advocates uh, a, 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 a very austere form of political quietism. So concern yourself with the correct practice of what they consider the Sunnah. Um, uh, the Wahhabis were the first in Islamic history to introduce uh, congregational prayer co by compulsion, compulsory congregational prayer. Uh, one of the things that most people don't know is that the Hijaz uh, itself, initially when the Wahhabis entered Hijaz, they assured the Muslim world that they were not, had no plans to rule Hijaz because the Muslim world was in absolute shock in 1923 at uh, the, the idea that such a crazy fanatical group would rule the Hijaz. But the that duality of as long as the the rulers uh, support a religious theocracy at the social level, then it is not your business to question what the rulers do. One of the favorite traditions, uh, falsely attributed to the Prophet, that the Wahhabis always cite, 
is obey a ruler regardless of how unjust, even if they flog you, beat you, torture you. Mm -hmm. And and that and so Bin Laden Bin Laden's great disagreement with the the, the traditional Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia was that he introduced a political activism element in Wahhabi theology, which Wahhabis completely rejected uh, uh, because it, it it broke away from that political quietism necessary to maintain the status quo as it is. Just a quick last question uh, from the Imam. Uh, and before we take Q and A, um, you work in terms of, uh, of um, addressing that Islam and democracy are compatible, and uh, Iran, for example, is a theocracy and a democracy. And in this culture, uh, theocrats tend to be rather uh, very, very extreme Christian fundamentalists, like. For, the, for example, Ted Cruz's father, they're, they're, they're dominionists. They believe in biblical law. Um, so what is the, uh, uh, how, can, how, how can theocracy and democracy be compatible? I don't think Iran is completely a theocratic regime because um, as you mentioned, theocracy in Islam, it means the rule, the absolute rule of Sharia, Islamic law. And in Iran, uh, Islamic Sharia is not uh, uh, dominant in, in Iran. There are certain uh, rulings in Iran that uh, contradict the, the, the Islamic Sharia. And uh, so maybe in a way it is theocracy because it is headed by a theologian. A theologian. But when it trickles down to uh, you know, daily life of the people and how people uh, perceive Islam, there is some departure between the uh, Islamic law and, and the, the political law uh, and the social law in Iran. So, um, and they admit to that. They admit, you know, it's not like Saudi Arabia where uh, Sharia law is implemented, but uh, like the penal code is implemented in Saudi Arabia, but only on the foreigners, not the Saudis, only on the foreigners. If someone steals, they chop his fingers. But if, uh, if a prince steals billions of dollars, they, they you know, clap their hands for that. So uh, I, I, I don't look at Iran as a complete uh, you know, uh, theocratic regime. And now we have a promising you know, president. I personally met him when he came to New York. Uh, I had a session with him, and I encouraged him to continue his overture with, with the United States and also with Saudi Arabia. And I said to him, Two big countries, Iran, which represents the Shias, and Saudi Arabia, that represents the Sunnis, uh, are fighting with each other, and this is not good for the for the Muslim Ummah, Muslim community. So you have to, uh, you know, do something to uh, reach out to the Saudis to at least save, you know, innocent lives. So let's take some questions here. There are microphones on both sides. Uh, there they are. Is there any difference in Sunni and Shiite how women are treated culturally? Do you want to take it, Imam? Well, w one is bad and one is worse. This is the. <laughs> 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 right. Another question here in the front. <laughs> Thanks for that answer. My question for Mr. Ghazvini, did I hear you correctly when you said United the drone campaign is not good enough or successful enough and United States has to attack the route? I mean, do you agree that US foreign policy is the root of the activism amongst fanatics and had e even had extended into domestic policy and we see it with the absence of Hamid Dabashi tonight here? So that's created the problem so some aspects of U.S. foreign policy contributed into the rise of extremism in the Muslim world. Yes, I agree with you. The way they treated uh, you know, the Muslims in the past, and still they are treating some of them now, contributed. But uh, roots of extremism was founded in Islam centuries ago. This is, we cannot put the, the, the blame solely on the West and the United States and the imperial powers. Yes, they have some share in that. 
But we have to be fair enough to admit that there is a lot of dictatorship within Islam. Uh, those who succeeded the Prophet Muhammad so, so many, for so many centuries, the Umayyad dynasty, the Abbasid, even the Ottomans and others, and even today, even today who are ruling the Muslims in the name, in the name of Islam, whether they are in the, this block or that block, they are committing uh, mischief uh, in Egypt, for instance. Why, why people, you know, why do you find extremism in Egypt? Because there is no job, there is no future, no health care, no education, no housing, no dignity. What do you expect a guy who, who graduates from school to do, you know? He's jobless. Even now, after Hosni Mubarak, you know, uh, people are living in the cemeteries in, in Egypt. So this is part, of, we have to admit that, yes, part of it is America's foreign policy and the West, but the major chunk of that are the Muslims, Muslim rulers mishandling Islam. You touched on it a little earlier, but I'd like to get uh, specific from, from each of the speakers that in the West, you've had a long tradition of separation of church and state, which has seemed to be fairly successful. Would you like to see in Islamic countries the separation of mosque and state? How about you? Uh, I mean, the... the there is no mosque, a single or even institutional um, mosque, proverbial or archetypal mosque in Islam. Uh, you have mosques don't even uh, have a clergy uh, heading them, uh, and you don't have any institutional uh, structure unifying the idea of mosques. Um, I have... Uh, 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 I mean, I, I would respond to this question at several levels. Um, one, the idea of secularism and, and, and separation of church and state is not a long-established tradition. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly new historical phenomena uh, by academic scholarly standards, even in specifically including the West. Second, is that if Secularism means that the state does not, or the government does not represent the divine will or rule in the name of God, uh, then that is very deeply rooted in the Islamic tradition. Uh, the, the, in fact, the idea of uh, uh, the head of the political order or the khalifa representing the divine will has never anchored uh, or successfully rooted itself. Um, so, it, but, and, and that, of, it, it goes without, uh, is, uh, in, in the Muslim world, that the, the uh, Saudi Arabia uh, is the historical pariah. I mean, you clearly see this, see this in the Muslim literature of the early 1900s, where Muslim theologians or jurists are claiming that there is a fanatic group that have arisen in Najd and that they will surely disappear. And the, the degree of confidence that Muslim jurists, uh, Sunni and Shia, uh, uh, talk about how this little fanatic militant group is going to dissipate and uh, and and the, the the absurd idea that the that the ima that the imam uh, becomes res dominates and controls uh, religious discourses and theology and, and uh, uh, was so odd at the time um, uh, that uh, uh, their most common label given to to even the Wahhabis was the Khawarij of today uh, that, that you find in uh, Khawarij means the fanatics of today. And, and again, this is in writings of late 1800s and early 1900s. But I don't think that, um, other than puritanical Wahhabis and those who accepted Walayat al Faqih in, in the Khomeini type paradigm, that, uh, it, 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 that uh, there is a, uh, among the mainstream Islam, the, the, the regular Islam that you see socially and culturally, uh, it, it, there is any acceptance of the idea that the government would rule in God's name or even 
implement God's law as if it's privy to God's law. Uh, we saw this, and in, in also the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt went, uh, I mean, tried to, to uh, deny the idea that they had any plans to become God's spokesman. The reaction in Egypt was uh, very suspicious and very um, animostic to the idea of a, a, a government ruling in God's name in any sense. Uh, the only exception uh, that, I, that I am aware of in contemporary history is, on the one hand, Wahhabi Islam, and on the other, Khomeini's Wilayat al Um uh, But other than that, that tradition, uh, the, the sort of church and state paradigm that existed in Europe, is, is uh, 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 it's, uh, unusual historically. I mean, it's a, it's a thoroughly Western European phenomenon which mm. Um, uh, historically uh, was difficult to achieve anyone er anywhere else. Simply churches or religious institutions were not that rich and that powerful and did not enjoy that type of authority. It seems like when I read the Quran, there is a real difference between theory and practice. The notion of how women are treated, the discussion of women being treated in a egalitarian way and not being abused or treated as we often see them in the American press. So I'm not exactly sure if it's fair to say that it's easy to subjugate women within the context of Islam. But the question I had was this notion that a lot of American military have in that people are willing to die because they will have 72 virgins at their death. Where does this come from? Is this some sort of urban legend? Is it geared in the number of people who died at Karbala? What, what is the? No, no. I mean, I've, I, one, I want to say something about the issue of women because I tend to be uh, when there are no women up here, and uh, so I mean, all of us should uh, uh, be quite reluctant to address that issue. Uh, uh, I was raised by the, uh, uh, my first teacher in Islamic law and life, and the greatest inspiration in my life, my mother, was a thoroughly educated woman who taught my father to drive cars and to drive a car and obtain his driver's license, and uh, was the one who helped me memorize the Quran, and uh, she's the one that introduced me to uh, Sharia. I mean, so uh, it's very difficult to stereotype women as a category in the Muslim world. Uh, my sister, who's a forensic doctor, uh, um, uh, she uh, uh, cuts up cadavers and uh, ca decides causes of death, goes to criminal, uh, to crime sites, and she's in Egypt, uh, and, uh, and, and she, uh, as she's, she's cutting up a body, she she's eating lunch. Uh, I mean, so <laughs> where is that? Um, uh, these women uh, are very much Muslim, and uh, as my sister, if she was here, would tell you that she's very devout Muslim, and and that she, as far as she's concerned, represents a true Muslim woman than than any of the women in, in uh, 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 maimed and by Taliban and so on. And so uh, that issue, but I, I've um, the seventy-two version uh, uh, question. I mean, that that's another. Very good example of the exploitation of re uh, texts. Uh, after the death of the Prophet, there was an enormous movement of invention of oral traditions. And for a couple of hundreds of years, Muslims were not as keen about documenting uh, uh, what is attributed to the Prophet as carefully as they documented the Quran. And uh, uh, the amount of the invention movement uh, created a lot of very bizarre traditions attributed to the Prophet. What the, the Wahhabi movement did is it, and uh, this is in their critics is often said, is that they went through the tradition, selected the most masochistic, the most intolerant, the most patriarchal, 
and sometimes the most even gen from a gender perspective sadistic traditions and salvage them by defending their authenticity while ignoring everything else. And I wrote a book on, on that question called Speaking God's Name, in which I, uh, over 400 pages, I document uh, how, these invent how these traditions were, were selected and, and deployed and defended and so on. So the 72 traditions is yet is one among uh, the mass of uh, sexual fantasies that men through history would have, and they would project it onto someone with authority. Uh, and it, it re if you read the tradition in its original form, it, it reads like a, a like a, a, a uh, not to be crass, but like a, a, a waking sexual fantasy. Some guy was having a really intense sexual fantasy about 72 women, naked women around him, and uh, invented a, a, a long tradition that found other men that fantasized sexually about it, and then eventually it got attributed to the prophet. And, and while in Islamic history it got marginalized as an absurdity, it was salvaged and redeployed uh, in, to be very specific in the early 1980s by, uh, for political purposes by Wahhabi Islam. Um, I think both speakers seem to um, accept the idea that petro dollars are um, a main cause uh, or helping to spread like Wahhabi fundamentalism. Um, what is the interest in Saudi Arabia or other unnamed petro states in um, spreading this outside of Saudi Arabia or outside of um, where it really makes a difference in helping them to um, cement their own power? Good question. Why, why did the Saudis export Wahhabism? It was an alliance that goes back to 300 years ago between <clears throat> Al Sheikh on the one hand, who are the descendants of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, the founder of Wahhabism, and Al Saud, the uh, political branch. So one of them represented the religious branch and the other the political. And they decided to dominate uh, Arabia first. They started in Najd in their locality, and then they extended their uh, rule. About 100 and maybe 105 years ago, they dominated the complete uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula. And it's about political dominance. They want to have influence uh, outside their boundaries. And uh, they established uh, a center of propagation almost in every in every place, in every city, in every town. Uh, most of the mosques that uh, uh, you see anywhere, including Southern California, uh, are founded either entirely or partially by this money. They send books, literatures, and now they dominated the entire Arab media, the entire Arab media. There is no one single prominent uh, Arabic-speaking newspaper not to be dominated by them. The same thing with television, the satellite TVs, radios. Uh, this is about political dominance. If, but I, if I may add to this, that uh, just so uh, just to see the, the picture, how complex the picture could be, one of the Saudi-dominated media venues, you would think that all of them broadcast very boring religious uh, stuff. And actually, in, in, in reality, the most exciting, uh, sexually risque uh, um, entertainment comes from Saudi-controlled media outlets, like the NBC and CBC and LBC. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it's a duality where, on the one hand, you've got ch uh, Quran or religious channels that make everything prohibited. I mean, they make your life a living hell. Uh, whatever you do, God is angry, and you cannot appease God. But on the other hand, I don't know, and maybe the Imam could tell me if he knows, I don't know if any major uh, Egyptian, uh, um, Arab singer or dancer or uh, cutting-edge performer who 
uh, doesn't rely on some extent or another on Saudi petrodollars. It's a, it's a, 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 I mean, and just to, to answer why are they interested in the U.S., well, in the Iranian Revolution, back when it occurred, the, the, I remember very vividly the debates about that the, or, that the Iranian Revolution originated among Iranians studying, Iranian students studying in the U.S. and friend and, and Iranian intellectuals living in France, and at that time. Uh, I think that was sort of the moment of awakening in among uh, the, the, especially the Al Saud family and uh, who always send their kids to be educated in the West. I mean, I, whether you know this or not, the entire Saudi royal family and the entire royal families of the Gulf are educated in Western institutions, Harvard, Princeton, at UCLA we don't have many of them, but um, you get the picture. And uh, and they they the command of English is far superior than the command of Arabic. Their knowledge of Western culture is far superior than their knowledge of their own native culture. But what they're weeded on, what they're what they're weaned on, is the idea that there is a truth that is privy to you as a wealthy, rich person in power, and then the truth that is good enough for the rest of the Muslim world. And the truth that is good enough for the rest of the Muslim world, the average Muslims, is that Muslims are ignorant, stupid, and illiterate, and so they shall remain. Hmm. And, and uh, uh, that is so concrete. It's, it's, it's obscene how concrete it is in, in, in many of the writings within the institutions of power and, and the narratives and discourses of institutions of power. And they, the biggest fear in Saudi Arabia and, and many of the Gulf countries like the Emirates and um, the Emirates and so on, and we saw this in Bahrain, by the way, was the Bahraini revolution and the, the, the attempt to portray it as simply a Shia sectarian rebellion, is that we, the wealthy, Gulfy uh, families send their kids to study in the West. Well, some of these kids, the ones that belong to the ruling families go back and they, they have a golden spoon. Uh, they never create problems. But how about the kids of families that went from the ruling class to high middle class or low high class? Well, these kids who have studied in the West have started processes very similar to what happened in Iran in that they are espousing rebellious liberal ideas about democracy and human rights and so on. And that is exactly why any investment in controlling Islam coming from the West or Europe is worthwhile from their perspective. But just to follow up on that question, uh, uh, Imam, I don't understand the Saudi end game. Uh, I don't understand what their end game was creating the Taliban in Afghanistan in radicalizing Pakistan and particularly now uh, funding al-Nusra and uh, these other fundamentalist dangerous um, um, groups in, in Syria. And you know the Saudis run such a tight regime, they control the country, and yet somehow they can't control all this money flowing out. They say, oh, it's not us, the government, it's private rich individuals doing uh, Islamic charity. And the idea that you en would end up with a S Somalia on the Mediterranean ca cannot be in anybody's interest. So I just don't understand the Saudi endgame. It cannot be in anybody's interest, but it, it, it can be in, in Saudi's interest. Because Saudis, <coughs> they know they have many radical elements within them. They, have, uh, they know that uh, because of what they did, uh, their version of Islam, the Wahhabi version, they created this a huge tsunami of radicalism and fundamentalism in, in, the, in the entire Middle East. And they fear for their own rule. They, they know that they will come back at them one day. I so see. they try to disperse all those, you know, one day in Afghanistan, the other day in Iraq, now in Syria, tomorrow it could be in, you know, uh, they, they are doing this as a means of protecting their own selves. 
But we believe that one day all those, the hub of international terrorism is going to be in Riyadh, in downtown Riyadh one day, sooner or later. Well, I'm interested uh, in, uh, we see the tension in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Uzbekistan, Sunni Shia, but what about here? American Muslim institutions and groups have been refusing Saudi money. How are Sunnis and Shias getting along in the United States? As an imam uh, serving uh, Islam, Muslim community in this country for the last 20 years, I see there is some departure from what we are experiencing in the Middle East. But not to say that we completely, we did not have this friction or this tension, we did. We did, especially after the removal of Saddam Hussein uh, from Iraq in 2003, uh, and the political gain and the strides that the Shia made in the Middle East, there were some uh, elements here who were uh, unhappy with that, and we had some clashes, you know, in, in Michigan and other places. We had many Shias were kicked out from Sunni mosques here, actually where when Saudi Arabia wanted to donate money to mosques here in Islamic centers, they have only one condition, only one condition, that we give you this m money, provided that you don't allow the Shia to come there and worship. Yeah, this is the only condition. You can allow the Buddhists, the Jews, the Christians, the atheists, but only Shias, they don't have, you know. And let me add something to you uh, to this. I travel worldwide with this, my religious, you know, <clears throat> uh, my religious uh, uh, form, or uh, uh, uniform. But uh, the only place where I don't wear this religious uniform is when I go to Saudi Arabia. When I land in Medina and Mecca, I don't, because my life will be in danger, literally. I'm not exaggerating. My life will be in danger. So I can wear this. I did wear this in a, at a conference in Las Vegas, in Paris, in Honolulu, Hawaii, in down to, uh, Manhattan, New York, but I cannot wear this, you know, my turban. And I originate from Medina. Uh, as you heard, you know, I, I go back, you know, to, to Prophet Muhammad and my forefathers, they all lived in, 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 in Arabian Peninsula, in the city of Medina. But nowadays, I don't dare to wear my turban and my religious uniform, uniform in my ancestral uh, land. So this is part of what we experience, unfortunately. Well, gentlemen, I thank you both for coming here tonight.